God bless you, everyone. This is Pastor Esther Raven here, and we want to thank you for joining us at Ignite Life Center. It's no coincidence that you're here with us this morning, and we just want to say that God has a word for you. If you want to find out more about our church, go and visit us here at ignitelifecenter.org. We want to meet you. We want to get to know you and get ready for an amazing and powerful word. Get your notebooks out. Get your coffee out. It's going to be a great time. Thank you. 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 14. When you have it, say, I got it. And for those that don't have it, it's on the screen. It says, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit. I want to talk to you today from the subject, guard the trust. Guard the trust. Father, would you speak to us today that we would leave conscientiously knowing, believing, understanding, coming and encountering your truth that you have deposited something in us that's worth guarding. Lord, I thank you because we're living when we are living. Thank you, my God, for specifically planting us in this dispensation. We could have been born in another country in another time, yet you chose to have us here sitting together in 2023 because we know that there's purpose and there's a mission assigned to us. And I pray for those that have white collar jobs, blue collar jobs, educators, doctors, lawyers, blue collar workers, maintenance personnel, housekeepers, I pray, my God, that we would leave today knowing and understanding that there's a trust that you have imparted to us, that we'd be better for it, better fathers, better husbands, better mothers, better wives, better servants, better leaders, better workers, better friends, that our relationships would be enhanced, that our com communication would be enhanced, that our worship would be enhanced. Irregardless of our background, irregardless of how we were born, where we were born, of our culture, that we would love you beyond measure. We ask you this in Jesus' name we pray. Can somebody say amen? Amen, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap today. You can. Black coffee with no, that's black coffee and a little, they didn't put no sugar on it, boy. I almost fell back <laughs> under the power of Cafe Bustelo. <laughs> We're living in a culture that relies, as you know, on technology rather than community. Most people feel more comfortable watching church services from the comfort of their home than actually going to church. I believe it's not really the comfort of their home, it's the discomfort that social constructs bring people. A society in which we prefer written words over spoken words is the one we live in. It's not lost upon me that we prefer People prefer to judgmentally stare at others than look into each other's eyes. Looking into each other's eyes without no strings attached makes people uncomfortable. The Bible says that the eyes are the windows to the soul. It's almost as if we have drank the Kool-Aid that society has built and we've disregarded the word of God as the pillar and the oak and the substratum of life. Look at your neighbor and tell him we were made for each other. Tell him that we were made for each other. That's important. Because what society wants you to do is to live narcissistically. In other words, the, the greatest person you honor is you. I can take you for hours at a time through scriptures that specifically tell us that we were made for others. 
We were not made so that we can glorify ourselves. We were made to glorify other people. We were made, of course, to glorify God, but it's through other people. We were made to celebrate other people rather than celebrate us. We were made to wish other people happy birthday. Today, we wish ourselves happy birthday. It's the craziest thing. Happy birthday to me. I've seen that. Happy birthday to me with a selfie on it. It's crazy. Merry Christmas. That's like you wishing yourself a Merry Christmas. I don't understand it. But here's what the enemy, here's what the enemy, the enemy of our souls, Satan, Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies, here's what he has introduced subtly to this generation. That as long as you can be sustained through the power of you, you don't need anybody else. That's why single parents are adopting children stating in the name of those children, well, it's better for them to be adopted by a single parent than not be adopted in the name of self-sufficiency and self-sustainment. We don't need, I don't need a man in my life, some say. I don't need a wife, some say. I don't need a church, some say. I don't need to be a part of. I'm self-sustained. That's the, that's the gospel of self in these end times. The, the Bible says that in the last days, and we're going to finish this, we're going to finish this uh, message with, with one of the premier verses, how God, through Paul, forecasted what we're seeing today 2,000 years ago. That's called prophetic. Where the Spirit of God revealed to Paul what 2023 would look like, and he writes as if he was alive today, looking around and gazing at his culture. And he starts writing, and the writing becomes a warning. It's an admonishment so that we would, we would disdain and we would feel uncomfortable whenever we see the diametrically opposed opposite that we read in Scripture. Is anybody alive today? Suppose, suppose you're an extra in, 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 in an upcoming movie, is what I assemble this to, assimilate it to. And you, 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 you will probably scrutinize that one scene where hundreds of people are milling together, just waiting for that two-fifths, somebody say two-fifths of a second, or I should have said one-tenth of a second was Jonathan at. That one-tenth of a second, if you watched the Miami game last night, you know what I'm talking about. When you can see the back of your head, just imagine that. Imagine that you're an extra, and they're going to, there's a scene and the back of your head is going to show in one-tenth of a second. Maybe your mom and your closest friends and your people, your tribe, your group, your clan get excited for that tenth of a second. Maybe. But no one else is going to realize it. Just you. Somebody say, just me. Listen, even if you tell them that you're in it, they're not really going to care. Let's take it a step further. What if you rent out a theater on an opening night and invite all your friends and family to come and see the new movie about you. People will say, man, you're an idiot. <laughs> Put it mildly. How could you think this movie is about you? Many Christians today are even more delusional than the person I've, I've been describing because so many of us think that life is about us. And to be honest, it doesn't really matter what place you find yourself in right now. Your part is not to bring you glory, but to bring God glory in that hyphenated, that hyphenated engrave, uh, 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 engraved engravement on that tombstone that hyphen signifies your life and the totality of your life. The prefix to that is your birth date. The suffix to that is your death date. But that hyphen is what is going to matter in eternity when we stand before God. 
And the number one question that's going to resonate throughout the walls of heaven is going to be the question we're going to have to answer. How did you bring glory to Christ? How did your life bring Christ more glory? You see, because your part and my part here to, in this world is to bring God glory. The Bible says this, and I'm being convicted of this more and more every day. I'm being honest with you. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't expect to be convicted about this in my 50s, but I am. Whether eating, the Bible says, or drinking, that's whether eating a una chuleta, whether eating a plate of spinach, whether eating a sandwich or on a lunch break or drinking coffee, right, whether eating or drinking, do it for the glory of God. The point of your life my friends, is to, is to bring God glory through your daily actions. Whatever you're doing, God wants to be glorified. Whoever you're talking to, God wants to be glorified. Whatever you're thinking, God wants to be glorified. Whatever you're saying, whatever you're attempting to do, whatever you're jumping out of the boat for, whatever you're willing to die for, whatever you're willing to live for, God wants to be glorified. Whatever you're willing to build, God wants to be glorified. You can have a house and not, and not have a home. God wants to be glorified in the home. You can have a wedding and never have a marriage. God wants to be glorified. You can have a Rolex and still not know the time. God wants to be glorified. You can have a $15,000 tempur bed, the one that you can, you can actually manipulate the temperature and keep it at 69 or 70. God wants to be glorified. Or you can keep it at 102, 103, which would be my wife's settings. God wants to be glorified. You can drive a Benz, you can drive a Beamer, you can drive whatever luxury car you can fathom. God wants to be glorified. God wants to be included. God wants to be added. God doesn't want to be your mistress. God wants the totality of who you are. And he wants to be glorified. Whether you're a police officer, he wants to be glorified. Whether you're a pastor, he wants to be glorified. Just because you're a pastor doesn't mean that you glorify God with your actions. Some people are more business-driven than they are God-driven. That means nothing. Whether you're a housekeeper, whether your assignment is to clean, God wants to be glorified. Whether you're a mechanic and get greased up from knuckles to, to elbows, God wants to be glorified. In every text, in every phone call, in every relationship, God wants to be glorified. Can you say that with me? God wants to be glorified. And I pray that this is the anthem. As I was praying, God, I prayed, God, let that be the anthem. Let that be the mantra. Let that be, let that be the constitution of all of our lives. God wants to be glorified. That every step we take, God wants to be glorified. How you're raising your kids, God wants to be glorified. That our actions will glorify God. That our speech will glorify God. That what we watch on Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, Voodoo, Disney, that whatever we watch on HBO Max, God wants to be glorified. Listen up, you Boston Red Sox fans. God wants to be glorified. That's why I watch Yankee games. God wants to be glorified. I believe that God's robes has pinstripes. I'm, I'm sorry. God wants to be glorified through your actions. God wants to be glorified in your marriage. Listen up, men. How you see your wife, how you look at your wife, the perspective you have of your wife and your kids is going to ultimately funnel at the rhetorical question, did you glorify God. How you treat that person sitting next to you, behind you, in front of you. Does it bring glory to God? This isn't to, this isn't to bring guilt. Guilt is of the devil. Condemnation is of the devil. There's no guilt for those that are in Christ Jesus. Conviction and guilt are two different things. But if you let society's narrative dictate, dictate what's happening you're going to easily be veered off and deviate to believe what this world or the spirit of this age believes. And they'll, and they'll, and they'll, and they'll, and they'll mix things like accountability. And, and, and if, you, if you drink the Kool-Aid, you'll be thinking accountability is an attack. If I ask you, hey, John, how's your marriage, man? How's your life? How are you doing? Uh, if John is offended, he's going to think I'm attacking him. If he's glorifying God, he's going to be thankful for the questions that are, that, are, that are the ones that are marginalizing his frame because he knows that he has a corner that he can... Is anybody here today? Mike Tyson loses his belt at the age of 23 and he never gets it back simply because he had a bad corner. 
he had no corner. And he loses to a 47 to 1 named, uh, a, a boxer named Buster Douglas, who was a journeyman. Buster Douglas, February 10th in Tokyo Dome, beats Mike Tyson because he did not have a corner. He bought his friends from, 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 from Brooklyn, from Brownsville, Brooklyn, his homies, because he was at that time in 1990, 1990, he was worth $300 million. And in 1990, he decides, I don't even need a corner. I don't really train for these fights. This guy, I'm going to knock him out real quick. And we, we all knew we were, I was, I was 20 years old back then. I remember Mike Tyson fights, you could, you could not, you better get what you're going to get to eat at that moment when that bell rang, that fight can be over quick. Buster Douglas had other intentions. If Buster Douglas starts stiffing Mike, jo Mike Tyson with a jab, his eye ballooned when he goes to his corner, fifth round, no ice, no compression, no answer, no, sh no strategy, nothing, because all he has is his homies in the corner that were telling him, telling him kind of like, you're winning the fight. I'm going to parenthetically insert this, but I want to pause on that for a second. I'm going to finish this, that, that, that story. But I think sometimes we have that Mike Tyson syndrome. And we rather, we rather know that we're not doing good, that our marriage is not good, our relationships is not good, our health is not good, our, our wealth is not good, our mental wealth, mental health, our perspective is shot, we're offended. We, we, some people go to church just to nitpick on on, on things that go wrong in church. That doesn't glorify God, and you don't fool God. But I think sometimes we suffer with the Mike Tyson syndrome because we'd rather be, listen, we'd rather, we'd rather live uncomfortably, even if we have one eye because the other one is swollen, even if we're losing the battle and losing the fight and losing the war at home, as long as we got a cooing flock of people we call friends that are affirming us as we're getting our butts waxed. That is the delusion that we live in today. We call right, this is biblical, we're going to call right, wrong, and wrong, Back in the 70s, I got a, I got a F in the class, or, 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 or my teacher would, would not let me go and go to the gym or go to physical ed or whatever it was. Um, if my mom found out, hmm, hmm, hmm. As a matter of fact, I remember vividly, vividly. My mom would go and speak to at a, a fifth fifth grade teacher, uh, 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 and she go to the fifth grade teacher, at Miss 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 Miss, uh, Miss Goldman, and she tell her she go because they call her, and she listen, listen, listen. My mom would go. It would be winter, so my mom was rocking this like it, it was like it was fake fur. It was fake fur. <laughs> what do you call fake fur now? You call it faux. It was faux. My mom was rocking faux back in the seventies, y'all. Faux fur. But she thought it was she thought it was mink. She rocked that thing. Four foot eleven. She go, and you know, she was she had like a big bag. She always had a big bag. In that big bag, you would not believe what she had. She had weapons in there. One of them was a I'm, I'm kidding you not, one of them was a belt about that thick. Listen, belt that thick. I don't know where she got the belt because there was no man in the house. But my mom was a freak as all right. And as Ms. Goldman, as Ms. Goldman was telling her, well, here's the problem we're having with Mark. Mark doesn't stay still. Mark puts his chair up. He props it up and he rocks. Back then, we didn't have the chair and the desk. You just had the desk and you had a chair. And he propped, I'm, I'm older than y'all, right? Uh, for Eunice, it was a rock. But for me, so, let me, so, <laughs> so I, I, I cocked the chair back. I cock the chair back, and I'd be rocking because I couldn't keep still because I like rocking. And then I like talking. And then when I, when, I, when I found out this magical thing that happens in your mouth called uh, 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 um, 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 Bazooka Joe's, 
Man, I'd be chomping gum and blowing bubbles. And my mom said, and, 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 and she'd be telling her that. And then when she get to the park, yeah, and I told him that he couldn't go to the gym. He gave me an attitude. That was all my mom. That would stir her up. And as she was talking, she was taking that belt and wrapping that belt. She said, uh-huh, tell me more. Mm -hmm. Just like that. And, and one time she told Ms. Goldman, she said, go. She told my teacher, go inside, go to the class. Because this was right outside the class. She dismissed my teacher. Go to class. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, she beat me down. DCF would have kept my mom in prison. And then I had to go back into the class after they knew I just got the lights turned off. Now, 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 if a teacher has an issue with your son or daughter, you sue the teacher. You sue the school. Because little Johnny can't do no wrong. Our first inclination is defense. Our first inclination is, is getting defensive. <clears throat> first inclination. We were in a pastoral thread, and we're talking to pastoral thread, and somebody made a great comment, a great comment, and the person got defensive. And these are people that have been in the Lord for a long time. Somebody say a long time. I'm like, wow, this is an epidemic. And it was God telling me, I want you to bring this tomorrow. We get defensive. People get defensive. Mike Tyson ultimately gets knocked out. And he never took responsibility, never took blame. He never blamed, listen, he never blamed himself. He blamed his corner. Kind of like the Oscar De La Hoya syndrome if you're a boxing fan. Oscar De La Hoya would lose fights and then he'd, get, he'd fire the whole team. Which is what Ryan Garcia did. They never look in the mirror and say, you know what? I need to develop. I need self-control. I need discipline. I need to follow the regimen. I need to follow the routine. I need to follow the process. Look at your neighbor and tell them, there's a process. Come on, just tell them, there's a process. And if you want to be great in life, there's a process there's a format, there's structure, there is an outline already, already constructed for you to walk it out. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, there's a way for you to be successful. Joshua 1.8, Joshua 1.8, there's a way for you to be successful. There's a, you to, there's a way for you to walk in joy. There's a way for you to walk in authority. There's a way for you to walk in dominion. In dominion. Keep this book of the law always that's the Bible on your what? Lips. That means read it. And back, back then you would read, read audibly like, like the Judaic custom. And not just read it, but meditate on it. What? Day and night. And not just read it, keep it on your lips, meditate on it day and night. What else did it say? Follow it so that you may be careful to what? To do some things in it. Whatever's convenient. Whatever you don't get offended with. Come on, y'all. Talk to me, y'all. Talk to me. Everything written in it. Then, that's cause, here's the effect. Then you will be, and then you will be, and then you will be, and. Could it be that the reason why we don't see the prosperity and success we used to see is because we're not in the word like, we, like the ones before us were? Do you, think, do you think it's random, it's just random that most of the, of the richest people in this world will tell you that the Bible is the number one book guide? Do you think it's coincidental that they give 10% of their organizational, of their company's earnings to a nonprofit? It's called tithe. Do you think that they got that way or they got to those levels or they got to that? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not vouching for their lifestyle. I'm just saying, do you think the Bible is, the Bible is not wrong. The Bible is right and it'll prove to be right. 
It proves to be right even years after it was written, 1,800 years, 40 or so people. They didn't know each other. A lot of them, most of them didn't know each other, and yet there's a thread, there's a theme. That theme is that God loves humanity to such a degree that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for whosoever should believe in him should not, they shall not, they shall not, they shall not die and go to hell or be in perdition or be in eternal separation. They, they, it talks about hell and it talks about heaven. They shall have everlasting life. That's what the Bible says. And it has instructions because there's a process. Somebody say there's a process. If we believe the lies of today, we will live as nomads, going from place to place, trying to find the perfect scenario or the perfect church or the perfect job or the perfect, or the perfect assignment, but never taking into consideration that it might be our fault. It might be me. It might not be that girl, my ex-wife, my ex-husband, them crazy kids I had, them, the stepkids, that boss that was full of the devil. That, no, no, it might be me. Now, I'm going to warn you, I'm going to warn you, Hang on to those promises in the word. And let me tell you this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to warn you. Hang on to the promises in the word because those promises, I'm going to speak a little faster because I'm, I know time is running and we got a great interpreter that is following me. Hang on to every word in the Bible, those promises that pertain to you. Because, because why promises? Because you're going to always see the opposite. When the Lord tells you, I'm going to bless you and your spouse, duck, because there's a storm coming. When the Lord says, when the Lord says I'm going to bless you financially, hold on tight. Because you're going to be at the brink of bankrupt or you might even have a bankrupt. When the Lord says, I'm going to use you to write books, the enemy is going to attack everything in your disposal that's going to allow you to write. When the Lord says, I'm going to use your children, I guarantee you, your children are going to be attacked. When the Lord, listen, the, the, the Satan heard when God, when God planned humanity out and he attacks his children. He attacks Adam and he attacks Eve. Then he attacks Cain by attacking Abel. The enemy's open door to control the motherboard of your life is to your children. This doesn't mean much when you're single and you don't have kids, but when you have kids, I, know, I thought the mothers and fathers in here were going to say amen, a resounding amen. He's going to attack your kids so that, so, that he can, so that he can manipulate you, blackmail you, cause fear, and you will let go. There's a lot of parents today because of this parenting in fear, giving, giving their children, listen, a blank credit card all right, and, and, and not just a blank credit card, but affirming them all they want. We are raising our kids by giving them all the money they want and all the affirmation they need or they ask. And we think that's going to make us better parents because all of a sudden we were dragged down by this demonic narrative that you need to be their friend. They need friends. No, they don't need friends. They need men and women of God that will tell them this is the direction you need to go. Can somebody say amen? Fear is a spirit. Come on, I said fear is a spirit. But you're going to see the total opposite whenever we talk about the promises of God. And you got to have enough, whatever you call it, oomph, pizzazz. You're gonna, you got to have enough strength. You got to have enough resolve. You got to have enough boldness to say, I don't care what it looks like. I got a word from the Lord. Come on, if you got a word from the Lord, clap it up today. Anyone can preach when everything's going good. Anyone can preach when everything is good. Anybody can preach when everything is rose petals and beauty and majestic skies and cascading waters off the cliff and everything is nice. Like, like a, el beautiful, el, el yunque. Estoy viviendo en el yunque. Yeah, everything is good. Everything is nice. Everything is dandy. Everything is rich. Anybody can, an atheist can preach the gospel like that. 
But God is looking for those that are going through a process. And yet they're not preaching by what they're experiencing. They're preaching from a place that, from a place of encounter knowing who God is. And if he did it that, that, that time, that way, that day, he'll do it again today. Come on, is anybody here today? Come on, if you're going to clap, clap, come on. The reason why 11 years ago I was, able to, I was able to limp up here and get in this podium in 2012 and preach faith while my mother was less than a mile away laying in a, in a morgue was because I was not preaching from, the, from what I had. I was not preaching for what was in my bank account. I preached faith when we had no money in the bank. We preached prosperity when we had $5 in the account. I preached that God was taking us to another place when we were driving a jalopy, living in a 900 square foot home, talking about God's goodness and God's presence and God's power and God's faith and God's richness will follow you all the days of your life. When I was not known and nobody knew me and nobody invited me and nobody even allowed me or gave me opportunities to preach, I was preaching like I was T.D. Jakes. I was preaching power and fire and seeing deliverance and healing and salvation because I served the devil. Notice, I'm not preaching about what I'm going through. I'm I'm not preaching about what I do. I'm preaching about what he already did. Somebody get on your feet and praise him. Wait for God to bless you to preach. I know where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. Can somebody say amen to that? Don't say nothing. Your kids are strong out. Don't tell nobody you're Christian. Man, you just, your home is broken. Really? You're going to allow the devil to kidnap you, to sequester you, to gag you because of shame and guilt? My Bible tells me that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit created man. Let us, plural, make man. And he created Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve wilded it out. And that was God who created them and God who raised them. Does that mean that God is not fit to be a father? Just because your kids wilded out, that's not an indictment against you. That's not always an indictment against your parenting. Sometimes it is, but not always. Just because you fail is not an indictment against you. You got to stop. You got to divorce these lies that are on ABC, CBS, NBC, all throughout cable, all throughout YouTube. All, it, it's, it's, it's as if you control your destiny by your action. You don't control your destiny by your action. You control your destiny by following what already has been destined for you now, that doesn't mean it's going to happen automatically because it's, it's, permiss- it's, 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 it's a promise, meaning it's conditional. God said, you choose. You choose. And when you choose correctly, all the things that happen to you negatively, you can use it in a positive spectrum because you know that all things work for the good of those that love the Lord. What a lot of people don't know is that in Tampa, I went to the church that I was raised at. I tried to be a pastor in that church. We went through the whole election process, the first year of Ignite. I knew I was going to get that church. Ain't no doubt about it. Everybody loved Mark and Lisa in that church. So church, the pastor said, pastor, pastor was 80-something years old in the office. He closed the door. He says, I want you to be the next pastor of this church with tears. I said, amen. I felt like God knighted me. As a matter of fact, I started walking different. You know, you got that authoritative walk. I started walking different. Authority is shown in two places, the way you walk and the way you chew gum. You don't chew gum like this. No, you got that confident chew. I got this. Can I tell you what happened in the election? The only ones that voted for me were my family. And the six, six, nine people, nobody, nobody, no, they didn't vote for me. God was taking me through a process. You know what's crazy is that God told Israel, go fight the battle, and they fought the battle and they lost. And they come back to God and say, hey, you, you said go fight the battle. He said, I know, I told you to fight the battle. I'm just going to grade you on your obedience. I'm not giving you results. Talk to me, somebody. 
I know that's hard for you to fathom and to swallow because you guys, a lot of y'all control freaks. Greg James talked about super freaks, but I'm talking about control freaks. Meaning we want to control everything. That's why people get scared in airplanes because you can't control. You, 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 you're totally at the, you are at the, <laughs> you're at the mercy of that pilot. I used to tell my brother, my brother that, one of my brothers that passed away, Ray, he, he used to be afraid of a flight. He was a, he was a, a, a jokester. And I used to tell him, Ray, Ray, don't worry about it, man. You get on the flight, man. You Listen, listen, righteousness goes before you. You get on that flight, God's going to land that plane safely, brother. Believe in God. He said, yeah, but how about, what if the pilot, <laughs> exactly, come on. We trust his leadership because we trust his word. We trust his word because his leadership is good. And if there's one thing that God will not separate is himself from his word. Is anybody here today? Is anybody here today? Now, now, 2 Timothy chapter number 2, this is very important. This is very important because this is the last book that Paul ever writes. He can hear them. He can hear them sharpening the sword. He can look and see the bucket where his head will fall once it's separated from his shoulders. He knows his time has come. He knows this is the last book. This is the last book. This is not a casual book. This is the last book. And he's going to write with urgency. I'm sure his hand is trembling. He's writing with urgency. He's giving directives. He's giving instructions. And he's doing it with passion. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. This is eisegesis. I'm going I'm to I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna now, I'm gonna now, I'm gonna now give you what I believe. What I believe. See, I believe, I believe that he had to have some sort of, of, of a towel or a cloak to wipe the tears from that last letter because he knows that this is it. He says, I'm ready to be spilled like an offering, drink offering. My time has come. I fought the good fight. And they say that people, right before they die, they speak the most important things. And he says, don't forget, you must, not you should, not it'd be a good idea. Not this is, let me encourage you. No, no, no. He says, you must guard the trust. Guard the deposit. God put something in you. And that deposit, when you study it, is the treasure. Somebody say this with me. The treasure of truth. Guard this. The fact that there's salvific power inside of you. And that Everything that God did for everyone lies and rests inside of you. And you've got the power to release it to whoever you want. And when you release it, it will have impact. Why do you think the devil wants to separate you from people? Because he knows your assignment and the propensity that you have. I wish I had a witness in here today. There is a deposit. There is a treasure of truth. And Paul uses the word fulasso. Somebody say fulasso. Fulasso. Fulasso means guard, preserve, uphold, keep from being snatched, protect, shield. Only thing we shield today, we guard today, only thing we look at today, we meditate on from the time we go, get up to the time we go to bed is our cell phone. Yes? Yes? You can lose $10. You can lose $20. You can, you can lose a $100 bill. And you're, you're, you're like, man, what, what, geez, anybody got, lose your cell phone for five minutes. Who we got? It's like life is over. Life is over. Oh my God, where's my cell phone? Where's my cell phone? Do you get freaked out like that when you, when, when you don't know where your Bible's at? When you lose your Bible? Oh, yeah. We're like spazzing out. Where's my Bible? There was somebody here there just the other day. Cell phone, cell phone, cell phone, cell phone. I said, good Lord. i never seen you like that. I wish you were like that animated after the preachings. Where's the healing? Where, where's the deliverance? Where, where's my salvation? Where's my cell phone? Another young man battling this, he said, man, I got to go home and see my mother, and he's, he's living in my house. <laughs> I won't tell you his name. 
He said, I got to go. I got to go. I got to go hang out with my mom. And he comes up to me, and, I, and he's had trouble. You know, he's like, man, I need accountability with my cell phone, this, that, and that. And, you know, I got to take a flight. I got to go to the airport. I got to take a flight. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do the other. I got to meet with my mom and this, that, and the other. Uh, 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 he's like, uh, uh, P. Mark, I need, I need my cell phone. I said, you're going to get your cell phone? You're going to fly without your cell phone? You're going to be all right? I did it all my life. All my life. In the 70s. All my life. All my life. And there wasn't a pay phone in every corner, and I didn't have dimes. <laughs> Person next to you has a cell phone. No, no, go, you, you, go, go without your cell phone. He came back. He came back stronger because of it. Here's, here's something, that might, be, that might be a simplistic point, but the pro, here's the bigger point. The bigger point is that the devil wants you to rely and to trust things that are smaller than the big things of God. Talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. Some people, some people fear that because they haven't gotten married at the age of 30, that that's it. Their life is over. Oh my God, 30. Oh my God. Oh my God, I'm 35 years old. I haven't had a baby. I haven't had a baby. Oh my God. Oh my, God. my biological clock is kicked. What are you talking about, biological clock? Get in the Word! Well, Pastor, I'm lonely. Go to PetSmart, buy a puppy. <laughs> Amen, Pastor Godinas? Go get a dog. Stop majoring on the minors. And stop minoring on the majors. You must guard the, tr the trust from seven silent assassins. I'm going to say that again. You must guard the trust from seven silent assassins. Here's the trust that I got the power to set others free. I got the power to love. And I'm going to do that by loving people. Are you here? I'm going to do that by loving people. I think, online, I think online church is good. Some people need it. Some people have kids. They need it. And I'm, listen, I'm all for it. I think it's a beautiful thing when you and your family gather together. It's not, listen, because there, 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 there's, a, there's a special, there, there's, a, there's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tremendous opportunity to use technology. What I'm saying is don't allow that to be a scapegoat for you not understanding the value of biblical community. Because you're healing according to scripture. My healing is in your mouth and you pray for me and I pray for you and you hold me accountable and I ask you how's this going how's that going you don't have that if you're watching solo at home amen this is just a building y'all you are the church inside of the church can somebody say amen to that I know people that are sick. I know people, there's no, they're single moms. They watch online services. They got kids. Listen, we get all that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Don't let somebody put you in a box because of their judgment ways of seeing things. But what I'm telling you is there is value in closing all the portals of all the narratives that you hear of the age, which is anti-Christ. And it just, it's a setup for you to never walk into the God life. I wish I had a witness in this church. You must guard the trust from seven silent assassins. Number one, you must guard the trust from commonality. You were not made to be like everyone else. Oh, pastor, pray for me. I don't fit in. You're a misfit. You were not made to fit in. You don't fit into your job. Your job's currency is fear, is shame, is backbiting, is hypocrisy, is, is, is talking. No, that's not your currency. Your currency is love. I'm not like everybody else. I don't step on heads so that I can reach my next level. No, no, I wash feet to go to the next level. I'm not trying to rub elbows with the right people. Mm -mm. I don't rub elbows with the right people. Mm -mm. I eat with the right person. That's God. Are you listening? Relationships, people that cross your path, do you not know that through prayer, you can ask God, Lord, Lord connect me with the right people so that I would, I would see the glory of everything that you want to do. And I would understand this. And I say this as a former Yankee chaplain. I say this when I didn't have anything to my name. I say this when this church was busted up. I say this when, listen, we didn't have anything. We live in 900 square foot home. All I had, or I had nothing. We had absolutely nothing. I got my car repossessed in 1997. Not, not because I was a bad steward, but because I didn't make enough money. God was calling me to preach. I wasn't making no money preaching. I was going on, I was going on, on, a, on a preaching circuit. Lisa was going to school. She was getting her degree in USF. And we lived in 900 square foot home. All we prayed was $400 rent. I mean, things were tight. 
tight. Are you listening? Tight. And I had a friend that was making about $10 million a year. And God told me, don't you ever ask for money. This relationship, I'm going to teach you because you're going to teach, you're going to teach the masses. That it's not who they know. You will raise your eyes to the help mark and know that your help does not come from men, but from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Are you listening? Here's what the Lord told me. And we needed, we needed all the help we could get, and God gave it to us. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, the Lord told me one, one time, the Lord told me uh, in a specific, on a specific Sunday, the Lord said, I, I united you together, not so you can get from him, but so that you can give him. You don't have, you're not going to receive anything from him now. You're going to give him. And I would tell him, hey, man, we're in this relationship, but I want you to know I don't, I, I don't want nothing from you. I got something for you. I would say that confidently, and I had nothing, but I had the word of God. And what he needed was the word of God. And today, as I speak to his son who, who FaceTimed me yesterday, because Jafet, because he got engaged and he's excited. She's a woman of God. They're going to be living, they're going to be living in Valley Forge, doing good things. I just said, Lord, and listen, I was sitting down after that conversation. I said, Lord, thank you for your goodness. I couldn't stop but get emotional. Not because of, not because of anything other than God's goodness. This is a kid who could have been dead. This is a kid who came here depressed. Pastor Prejo laid hands on him, broke that power of depression over his life, served, listen, did things, bumps on the road, but today he's standing firm. Somebody give God a praise in this house. Listen. Say this with me. I'm not common. Say it like you mean it. I'm not common. I'm not common. Look at your neighbor and tell him I'm not common. I'm not common. I'm not like everybody else. I don't stress like anybody else. I don't conform like anybody else. My lifestyle, my convictions, my message, my passion, my prayer is uncommon. I'm uncommon. That is, that is the essence of the word of the word consecration. Is this good, Esther? Consecration. What's another word for consecration? Holiness. The opposite of holiness, I thought, was sinlessness or, or sinfulness. I thought the opposite of holiness was sin, sinfulness. No, the opposite of holiness is commonality. Because holiness means separation. Don't you know that when you were born, God consecrated you? That's why you've been a misfit. That's why you were rejected. Do you get it now? That's why people gave you the elbow. That's why you went through hell and back. High wall. That's why you went through the travesty that you did as a child. That's why you were adopted. That's why you went to foster care. That's why your father left you. Talk to me, somebody. That's why they didn't accept you in the church you came from. Because God is building something inside of you. I'm not like everybody else. I'm not like everybody else. Don't be like everybody else. Are you listening? You don't fear. Oh my God, the economy is going to crash. The economy can crash 10 times over. My economy ain't never going to crash. Because I'm not part of this government. I'm part of another government. I'm part, I'm part of the word of God. So that's a whole government established. Are you, are you listening? Oh, pastor, oh, like, I don't have an option. I don't care. If somebody told me, these are, these are true stories. I can't afford, from somebody from in Tampa, I can't afford private school. I want to send my kids to private school. I can't afford it. And I, and I was just listening because I'm very empathetic. I'm like, yeah, in the beginning it was like that. But like, right around the ninth minute, I'm like, sign up to public school. Because God's going to preserve them. God's going to be around. God's going to use them. God's going to, can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? One of the people that go to one of the churches that I usually minister, they tell me, hey, guess what, pastor? My daughter just graduated from public school, and she is, and she is on fire for God. Hello. Commonality. That's a silent assassin. You look around. That's what we do on Instagram, right? We look, we gauge what's happening on Instagram with so and so, what they're wearing, who they're married to, their relationship, how it's going, and and oh, hold up, this girl was always with this guy. She was posting her pictures with this guy, smooching with this guy, eating with this guy. The stories were all about the guy. The feeds were all about the guy. Now I don't see the guy, and then we scroll up. 
I don't see the guy anymore. They must have broke up. Come on. Come on, y'all. I, I'm a man of God, but I'm Puerto Rican. I'm nosy. <laughs> who, had a power, who had a power for this? Who had a power for that? Who had a power for Who bought a car? Who didn't buy it? Do you think, do you think, do you think you have time for all of that? Is that blessing you? No. It's making you common just like everybody else. And everybody else is bankrupt. Spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and many of them, many of them, many of them need you. The problem is that if you don't see yourself as the giant that God called you to be, then you will never be able to assess the situation. You will never be able to give what you need to give those people, which is life and which is the deposit that God gave you. I'm not even going to talk about the Holy Spirit's defense of what you have inside of you, but because He guards it. Can no devil take it? Number two. Number two. Disillusionment. Seven assassins. How many assassins? Mm-hmm. You must guard from the seven silent assassins. Disillusionment. Disillusionment is when I had expectations. <laughs> I only give disillusion if I had expectations, and the expectations don't quite pan out to what I thought they should pan out. I become disillusioned because I had an illusion. The expectation turned into a mental illusion. Is anybody here? I had a mental illusion. In other words, I created a whole story and it didn't happen. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. You only get offended. When you have expectations. If you have no expectations, you don't get offended. If your birthday, you get up and you don't expect anybody to wish you happy birthday. Those that remember, as busy as people are, they remember my birthday. I'm grateful. I'm not going to ponder on the five that forgot. I'm going to thank God for the 20 that did wish me a happy birthday. Is this good? Don't be common so that you don't go disillusioned. I sit with pastors all the time. I sit with pastors. You know how many boards I've been a part of and sit with pastors and everybody's trying to come up to be that church. And the first thing they said, we got we to gotta, we gotta be that church. We're going to have service for, for 60 minutes, Father. That means you sing two songs. Pastor's going to preach 20 minutes. And we're going to send you up because... Here's, here's why. Because I want you to keep coming. And I'm afraid that if church is a little too long, you might not come back. So I got I to gotta create an ambiance of entertainment instead of a cave of transformation. Not everybody. You can do a lot in an hour and a half. I think we can trim this service to an hour and a half. There's no joke coming to that. But what I'm telling you is, what I'm telling you is, hey, let's have hour and a half services. But the goal is that you come in here, you get, you come in here and you operate in the gifts because you are a gift to this body. And then you leave not only, not only, not only having imparted someone a gift, but you leave here empowered by somebody else. My God, that's powerful. That's the essence. Can somebody say yes? That's the essence. Number three, distraction. Your biological clock is a distraction. How much money you make is a distraction. There are things that can distract you from the common goal that God has for you and with you because he is co-laboring with you. As a matter of fact, is it? Wrap your mind around this. Jesus Christ right now is not sitting like this. He is speaking. If you were to take an Instagram shot of heaven right now, the throne, you'd see the Father sitting on the throne. You see Jesus at his right with his mouth open. His mouth open because he does not stop praying and interceding for you. 
And usually when they take a picture and you're talking, you come out with your mouth open. He is praying for you, for your children, for your future. He told Peter, listen, Satan has asked to sift you, but I've prayed that your faith would not fail. God is praying that your faith would not fail. God is praying that you will never get disillusioned. God is praying. Jesus is praying that you would never become distracted, that you would never become, that you would never become disillusioned, that you would never become common. Don't get distracted. Because the truth of the matter is that the reason why you're still single, come on, come on, ladies, is because you want to still be single. Meaning, meaning, if you were like everyone else, you could have had three kids and a multiplicity of guys, but you're waiting on God. And waiting on God, W-A-I-T-I-N-G, is, is W-E-I-G-H-I-N-G, is weighing on God. <sighs> I don't want the P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. -E I don't want the presence, the gifts of God. I want the P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. E-S-E-N-C-E, -E, the presence of God. It's starting to feel like uh, Jeopardy, but understand, number four, number four, discouragement. Discouragement. Discouragement because you don't see, watch this now, you don't see your disillusion, you had expectations, and now you're discouraged because, because, because you're comparing yourself to other people. Pastor Lisa, don't we talk about that all the time. When you compare yourself to other people, you're saying, God, I'd rather be a cheap carbon copy than an expensive original. I'm discouraged. I'm discouraged because... Is anybody here today, y'all? I'm discouraged because, because I've allowed the world, the systems of this world, I've allowed the narratives of this world, everything I, I see, I hear, everything I go to, social media, I see them, and I pit myself against them. Number five. So, so, so no, number four. So, encourage yourself. The Bible, the, Bible, the Bible says David encouraged himself. You can encourage yourself. Number one, you, can, you got the power to encourage yourself, encourage yourself when you talk, 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 talk. Not what you read in a book. You talk. Not just what David Goggins said, lest the curse words. You talk the word of God to your life. Because the devil ain't afraid of David Goggins. The devil, the devil, the devil ain't afraid of Simon Sinek. The devil, the devil ain't afraid of TED Talks. The devil ain't afraid of that master class. It's good to have that here in your mind, but you got to fight spirit with spirit. And the way you spiritually war is by taking spiritual armor. That's why the Bible tells us in, in uh, Valley, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 4 and 5, it says, do not, do not be... Uh, 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 the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 4. The weapons we fight with, they are not weapons of this world. Th on the contrary, they, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. What are strongholds? Those things that keep you captive. That depression, that doubt, that suicidal tendency, that hate, that anger. That, that feeling of despair, I'm less than, I'm victimized, victimization. I was talking to somebody last week, and for two hours, for almost an hour and a half, Rosa, an hour and a half, all they did was complain. And the thing is that they didn't they wake the spotlight out of uh, All they did was complain. Morning. <laughs> Amen? All they did was complain. And in the middle of the conversation, I look at my wife, and I say, man, this is crazy, and right in front of the person. I'm not used to that. I don't, I, there's, when you, when I had an encounter with God, I erased her, can't. I, I don't know what that word is. Complain. What, you know what complaining is? Complaining is a cheap attempt to impress other people with my problems. Asking for help is biblical. Complaining is not biblical. You ever had that phone call? They just complain, and you feel 
like you better get a Pepto-Bismol right after that phone call. Amen? They feel great. They just threw up on you. But now you carry all that. As a matter of fact, when they call again, you look at it and you're like, I don't. and then you remember Pastor Mark saying, you need to have integrity. And you're like, okay, you're about to pick it up. And then you remember Pastor Mark said, but you got to be wise. And then you like delete. You're like, <laughs> and somebody say, amen. Encourage yourself. Encourage yourself. Use the word of God. Don't you see that the word of God is a light unto your path? Don't you, don't you understand that the Word of God is everything that you need, whenever you need it, however you need it, at the moment that you need it? Don't you know that the Word of God, you can extract psalms and verses and read and post it up and speak it? Don't you understand that? You got to watch. You got to be a good steward of what comes out of your mouth. How are you doing today? Ahí muriéndome. No, no. Death is not on my lips. I will leave this world when God says it's time, but I'm not, I'm not going to die prematurely, and neither are you, and neither are your kids, and neither is your home, and neither is your marriage, and neither is your ministry. How you doing? I'm living it up. And can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? Only those that will end up in hell, can we use any of these phrases? We don't even know where the phrase is going. We are, how you doing? I'm living my best life, G. If you're going to hell, you're living your best life now. I'm living my best life when I get to eternity. Are, are you here? Uh, you ain't convinced about that. That's good. Number five, burnout. 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 Tired. We're tired. We're more tired than ever. 18s, 19, 20-year-olds have to sleep, have to hibernate. They're not even sleeping anymore. They're hibernating. Hibernating, playing video games and hibernating, playing video games and hibernating, playing video games and hibernating. And those affirming parents we talked about like 45 minutes ago, those affirming parents, they don't care, they're paying rent because they're living vicariously through them and they want to they wanna resolve or they want to leverage the mistakes that they made when they were young. So now I'm going to make it up. The problem is that Johnny was six when that happened. Now Johnny is 46 and he's still home. And not home because there's a plan in place. Not home because, because he's taking care of his parents. Not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Johnny's just playing. He has a virtual community. Like he's 16, 46 years old, grown man. Talk to me, somebody. Eating cold pizza. As a matter of fact, people are mastering the art of eating pizza without, without even holding the pizza. They put the pizza here, and they'll go, and they're playing, and they'll take a bite like that. Nails look like Wolverine. Breath smell like they got two dead raccoons in their throat. <laughs> Ain't shower. Forty something. Then they're talking about, I said, hey, bro, you got a girl yet? I mean, what's going on with that? Because I'm always talking about relationships. All you single people, I got y'all prayed up. <laughs> and I'm going to start hooking some of y'all up. In Jesus' name, unless you have the gift of celibacy. I operate in gifts, y'all. <laughs> Freddie said, please, Pastor, don't look my way, Pastor. <laughs> and then you ask him, man, how, how's it going, man? How's, 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 what's up with your relationships, man? Talking about, talking about, no, uh, uh. I got a list. A list? She got a list too, bro. She got a list. And on her list is not the guy that can master Call of Duty. <laughs> women women want to feel, women want to feel secure. But this is the kind of stuff that happens because we're not the generation with the strongest knees. We're the generation now with the strongest thumbs. And we're burning out because the energy comes from the Lord. Less Lord, less energy. If all you've got, if all you've got for energy is blueberries, raspberry, caramel macchiato, double shot, bang. 
black coffee. Are you serious? You're going to slay giants' heads on black coffee? You better have an energy that can keep you in the presence of God. And you might sleep four hours, but you're going you're gonna to fight that war as if you slept 40 hours. You have power. You have propensity. You've got God's keen way of thinking. Is anybody here today? I heard somebody talking about, I'm on a sabbatical. Sabbatical? You've been in the ministry two months. And you're going to take a sabbatical. Talking about, I'm, I'm burned out. I'm burned out. I'm burned out. And don't even ask. Don't even ask single people. It's offensive to ask women. Listen, it's offensive to ask single women in these times. Are you going to cook? That's offensive. That's, yo, come on, man. Come on, Amanda, I ain't even going to look your way because I know Amanda cooks. But come on, man. Don't ask a woman, if she, don't ask a single woman, can she cook? Because they get offended. They, if you don't know that, I don't know what planet you live on. They get offended. Am I right, Eunice? They'll look, they'll snarl at you. You're going to cook. Uh, let me ask you a question. You're going to wash clothes? What? This ain't the 50s. This ain't the 50s. So you're going to wear dirty clothes? I, I, don't, I don't understand. In the 50s, we wore, they wore clean clothes. So what does that mean? I, I wash clothes in my house. My wife cooks, but I wash clothes. Does that make me less of a man? Does that make you less of a woman if you cook? You keep believing that you're going to stay single till you're 70. Because guess what? Brothers out there, brothers out there, they want, they, they're looking for a girl that can cook, that can throw down in the kitchen. And that don't make you less of a woman. The wise woman edifies her home. But see, if we keep allowing the view to lay down our theological concepts, if we keep allowing Whoopi Goldberg to tell you what a woman should be, then you're going to discard the truth of God's, God's word and you will be impoverished the rest of your life. Now that deserves a hand clap right there. Come on. Even if you're liberal, I would have been clapping for that. I love Lisa. I love my wife. But let me tell you, I ain't going to lie to you. I ain't going to lie to you. First thing I wanted to find out about Lisa. First thing I want to find out, I went to a house, you know, casually looking. You know, we were already talking. But when I see her throw them platanos in the, in the, in the thing, I, I, I had an out-of-body experience. I said, this... Because the, the, pan, the, the pan she threw the platanos on, she was helping her mom cook. She'd been, she been cooking. The most sexiest thing my wife ever told me, sexiest, I'm going to be honest with you. This is my, this rated R. The most sexiest thing. My kids in here, you right? I kids in here? No? Y'all want me to tell y'all? Yeah, a bunch of, that's, that's the problem having a, Puerto Rican, a lot of Puerto Ricans in the church. Yeah, 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 come on. Give me the bochinche. <clears throat> give me the scoop. But if you're black, you know, you, you, you right there with us. Uh... Uh, when I saw Lisa throwing them plantains, the most sec do you not know the most sec the most <laughs> somebody's getting blessed. The <laughs> so, somebody pick Katrina off the floor, please. Um, <laughs> the, the most sexy the most sexiest thing my wife ever told me. And boy, she told me some sexy things. <laughs> and I gotta say that with a Teddy Pendergrass voice. Sexy things. You got, you got, you got what I want. She said, um, I've been cooking since I was 10 years old. My grandma showed me how to cook. I said, oh, my God. I said, God, this is, this is it. This is her. This is her. Some people looking at breasts, hips, butt, lips. I'm looking at kitchen resumes. Get out, of here. Get out. Get out. Get out. We lucky I don't send you back to Orlando. Get out. Let's all stand up. I ain't even gonna give you the last two. Y'all laughed too much at that. Get up. 
last one is offense, and the other one is pride. And then I want to finish off, Second T- Valerie, can you, can you put Second Timothy, that last verse up there? I want you to see this. This is Paul's last writings. I want you to check it out. Last writings. Offense and pride were the last two. Last verse. And I want you to get that this is so powerful. Because, and this is why I want to show it to you, because this is the value, the importance that you have before the Lord. God, don't you know that God has preserved you so you can impact somebody? Listen to what it says about, about, about the times. People will be lovers of themselves. I don't know about you, but I've heard this. I've heard this. We got to love each, we got to love, we got to love ourselves more in the name of self-care. That is true. But here's what the Bible says. We love each other too much. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive. That's the next one is crazy, is bizarre, because you would not think that that would be there. Disobedient to parents, like even in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, if your parents are alive, God still is watching if the way you treat your parents brings him glory. Ungrateful. Common. Holy. Keep going. Keep going. Without love. Unforgiving. Slanderous. The worst thing you can do is look at people to find their defects. You might as well go to a Ouija board and curse yourself because everybody that you can see around you is God's favorite creation. And the moment you nitpick and pick a fight and want to bully and look for defects, you're looking, you're picking, you're fighting against God himself. And guess what? God never loses a fight. God never loses a fight. Unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control. Brutal. Not lovers of the good. Treacherous. Rash. Conceited. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now hold on. That was me. Everything you just read was me. I was that. But God... Through his grace, heard a young man's prayer. And I said, God, I don't want to be that. I want to be love. I want to be the essence of love. I want to give, I want to, I want to love people. I want to give people hope beyond the scope of human limitation. That when somebody encounters me, that their dream would look more real. That they would feel more love, that they would feel hope, that the scales will fall out of their eyes with a conversation. Not what I give them physically, because I got nothing to give. I remember telling the Lord, but I just want, I just want to give them your word, remind them of their value. And can I tell you something? Valerie, that's good. That's good. Can I tell you something? He did it with me. So there's a twofold altar call today. First, this might be you. And today I pray that you would hear the word of God and that you would say, God, I don't want to be that anymore. Number two, maybe that's not you anymore. It's the second piece of that altar call. But that you and I would become, become more conscientious and we would start hunting. Somebody say hunting. Hunting people like this. Not to condemn them but to give them some of that trust, the power of salvation. My spiritual father, Raymond Carrion, believed in me, saw what I didn't see in me, believed and valued what I couldn't even value myself. And today, that's why I, wanna, that's why I honor that man. That's why I bring him here. Not because of what he can bring, but because of what he already brought. Is anybody here today? 
Can I tell you, everybody, I, well, well, Pastor, I don't know that many people. What are you talking about? All your Facebook friends, your Instagram friends, everybody that follows you, everybody on your phone, man, start hitting people up and just celebrating them. Man, you're amazing. Man, you're awesome. I can tell you this. I saw 1,000 young men in prison be radically transformed. I spoke to every part of them. I saw 400 of them come to faith. But let me just tell you this. I know the impact that one person has even when they're surrounded by prisoners that have been forgotten by the system. That's the power you have. Satan, serving Satan, a crip, a blood, MS-13, cutthroat, fam, don't matter the gang affiliation. Latin king, don't matter the gang affiliation. This affiliation is stronger than any affiliation on the face of the earth. Are you listening? I want you to close your eyes right there where you're at, man, and just reflect on these words. I know it's 1226. I get it. I get it. But I also get that we need this word. Can you look at me for a second? Will you look at me for a second? The day that I go to a movie theater, I like going to Regal movies. I love it. I like watching movies. I, can I be honest with you? I'm not a movie buff, but I think I know a lot about movies. Because I've seen movies. And if I can find space in my calendar to fit a movie, I'll do it. I decompress. Can I be honest with you? I've never, never determined when I'm in the theater to look at how long the movie is and let that be the determining factor whether I go back to Regal Theater. I don't say, what? This movie is two hours. What? I don't do four-hour movies. I don't do live sports either. Like, I, I record them and I go right through the commercials. I'm blowing through the commercials. Going through all the timeouts. Are you here? But I'll never go and watch a movie and say, two hours and a half, I know it looks good. This is a thriller or this is a drama or whatever it is. This got an Oscar, but it's two and a half hours. I don't know. I think when you sit there, you just enjoy. Stop doing that with church. Stop doing that with church because you know what? You know what? It ain't like you're going to invest the other time. And Come on. You're making an investment in yourself. Not make an investment in me or an ignite. This is for you. This is for you. This is for me. We need this. true self care. Is getting as much as God as you need to. Hello again, everyone. We want to thank you for joining us at Ignite Life Center. If this is your first time joining us, I want to let you know about Growth Tracks. Growth Tracks is a four-step course to help guide you into your spiritual development and divine purpose. It's broken up into four courses: believe, belong, become build. Number two, life groups. Life groups is a way for you to build community and cultivate a relationship with Christ within a small group setting. And lastly, we have Ignite Ministerial Institute. Ignite Ministerial Institute are courses where you can go deeper in your faith and in the word of God. And guess what? It's all from the comfort of your own home. All year round, we have open enrollment, so it's not too late to join. Sign up here for more information. We hope that you enjoyed the powerful and amazing word that was shared today. We hope to see you again. Visit our website. Follow us on social media for all of the new announcements and events that are happening at Ignite. You don't want to miss it. We pray that you have a blessed day and we thank you for joining us.